Hello, hello everyone. I hope that you are all doing very well and thank you for clicking on this video. I lit some candles today. I'm still dressed up from my previous recording that I did for my YouTube channel. So I hope you appreciate the little extra effort. So I was asking myself what I could talk about this week because I want to provide you with useful and helpful content. And all of a sudden, this idea came to me. Well, what to do after you graduate with a degree in piano performance? And of course, this will also apply to many other instrumentalists. I graduated with a postgraduate diploma from Trinity Lobin in 2019. And I remember for the first six months out, I felt incredibly lost. And if you are in this situation, especially with the pandemic going on, I want you to know, hey, you're not alone. And I really hope that this video can offer you some insights and some ideas. So, of course, if you have any questions for me, leave me a comment down below. Likewise, if you have feedback or ideas for future vlogs, I always welcome your ideas. Thanks guys. Okay, option number one, being a solo artist. Yes, I know this is probably the most obvious one and it is probably what most of you guys envisioned when you embarked on this journey and you got an education in piano performance. And by all means, go for it. So what are some ways that you can find performing opportunities? First of all, I don't want you to expect that these performances are just going to show up out of thin air. You are going to have to promote yourself and this is something you're going to have to learn to be comfortable doing. Because if you are shy and you don't introduce yourself, chances are opportunities are simply not going to come your way. I cannot tell you how many free copies of my CD and DVD I handed out and because I did that, I got featured on international radio stations, I was interviewed by music publications, and even got a few performing opportunities out of that. So even if you don't have a CD or an album, I highly recommend making a good quality recording. And you know what? You do not need stellar equipment to do this. If you have your phone, I'm recording right now on my iPhone 12 and the quality, it's not too bad. Now, I recommend that you do use quality microphones and if you do not want to purchase these, you can usually rent these from your university. When I was getting my master's at the London College of Music, I would often, well, let's say rent, although I didn't have to pay for it, I would book an afternoon or an evening in the concert hall borrow two other microphones and work with a student who was trying to build up his portfolio as a recording engineer. And by doing that, I was able to produce several high quality recordings for free. And the more you record, the more you have out there and available, the more likely people are going to take you seriously as an artist. Number two, have you ever considered finding opportunities as a collaborative pianist, because believe me, well, okay, things are a bit different now, but typically there aren't any shortages of opportunities for collaborative pianists. Even better if you decide to specialize with a certain group of instrumentalists. For example, when I was getting my bachelor degree at the University of Arkansas, I worked almost exclusively with the vocal department and we did everything, we did leader, we did operas, and because of that, I have an amazing repertoire list for vocalists. So if an opportunity ever presented itself in the future, or if I decided to pursue this route again, I could already show that I have a background in doing collaborative piano. If you are still in school, I definitely recommend this. Why not collaborate with a few other students that you really enjoy listening to who you believe in, and create something, make a few recordings and be sure to update your repertoire list. Branching off of this, let's go to number three, a repetiteur. And this goes hand in hand with accompanying singers, typically opera singers. 
So if you can play piano, if you have good sight reading skills, perhaps you know a few other languages, and you've tried singing yourself, you would be an excellent repetiteur. And if not, of course, these are all skills that you can build up. So a repetiteur wears many different hats. Yes, you are accompanying the singer, but you're also giving them tips and feedback to perhaps improve their pronunciation. You're helping them with their pitch and their tone. You're letting them know when they're flat or when they, you know, held that rest a little bit too long, as some vocalists tend to do, tend to do, tend to do. All right, number four, becoming a session musician. Now, granted, this is easier to do if you live in a big city. For example, when I was a Londoner, there were tons of opportunities for session musicians. I'm now living in rural France, so if I wanted to do this, I'd probably have to move to Lyon or to Paris. So, what does a session musician do? Well, usually an ensemble will hire you out, sometimes just for an afternoon, either in a recording studio or in a performance setting, and you are expected to read whatever they hand to you. Definitely an ability that you can cultivate. I do not believe that people are just naturally born sight readers, so don't let that discourage you from pursuing this. So you might be asking yourself, how do you find opportunities as a session musician? Great question. Well, for starters, if you Google it, there are several websites where you can build profiles so that people can find you. Likewise, in London, there were agents who specialized in working with session musicians. So if you're interested in dipping your foot in the water, find one of these agencies in your area, reach out and try to arrange a meeting if you can help it. It helps if you have some experience and a repertoire list and of course recordings to show them. Next, I have lost track. <laughs> so next we have the so-called ballet pianist, which guys is harder than it sounds. If you're just envisioning somebody who's playing a few chords for an elementary level ballet class, oh boy, you are wrong. <laughs> to be a good ballet pianist, you need to first realize that there are two main areas of work, the ballet class and the ballet rehearsal. So looking at the ballet class first, you need to have a good understanding of the rhythm of ballet classes. According to this interview on The Cross-Eyed Pianist with Nikki Williamson, she writes, Rachmaninoff, that it is the pianist's job to understand the general musical demands of the exercise and then interpret the teacher's setting including tempo, style, quality, and to provide suitable music. So yes, actually in a ballet class, you might be expected to improvise music at the drop of a hat. And not just any music, to do it in the tempo, the style that the ballet teacher was using. So obviously this requires knowledge of improvisation and spontaneity, creativity, it's a very dynamic job and it'll definitely keep you on your toes. No pun intended, maybe a little bit. <laughs> and similar to what I mentioned before, there is a chance you'll be expected to read orchestral reductions. So guys, you know what to do. Grab an orchestral score and get to reading. This is another job that you have probably considered at some point if you're not already doing it. And that is, of course, teaching. <laughs> The funny thing about being a teacher is that although you are teaching another person to play your instrument, you're actually going to be learning a lot in the process. Perhaps your student will ask you a question and you'll have to ask yourself that same question in order to give a good answer. I have had students ask me about voicing, about use of pedal, fingerings, and all of that has given me pause to think and reconsider what I am doing in my own interpretations at the instrument. So teaching is more beneficial than you probably realize. There is something so special and rewarding about taking a student under your wing and giving him or her guidance and advice and seeing him or her flourish. <laughs> 
I think it's one of the greatest things that we can do as a musician. After all, the reason why I decided to become a musician is to share this gift with others and teaching is an excellent way to do that. Now, here are some options that are not directly tied with teaching music or music performance, but I don't want you to rule them out. You see, you can combine several of your interests or even just one or two plus music to find a great fulfilling job. So for example, let's say that in addition to being knowledgeable about music, you're an excellent writer. Well, why not send your CV to music publications and see what you hear back? Perhaps you'll find yourself writing articles for Gramophone. Perhaps you'll find yourself doing research or copywriting. Likewise, perhaps you have a knack for social media. Why not get into social media marketing? There are several orchestras, professional and community, who are looking, and not just orchestras, by the way, we could say festivals, venues, who are looking to step up their game when it comes to advertising themselves online. And if you have knowledge and a gift in this area, that is also something very rewarding to do. Because after all, there are many social media marketers in the world, but how many social media marketers are there that are knowledgeable in classical music like you are? Granted, not very many. So go ahead, that's what I would recommend. Write down what you enjoy doing, write down all of your skills and see what you can blend together. I gave you two examples with writing and social media marketing, but of course, those are not the only ones. The last category is doing something else entirely. And I don't want there to be a stigma around this. I don't want there to be shame surrounding this. I think that many musicians feel as if they failed if they end up making their primary source of income in a field that is not related to music. However, I'm going to disagree. There is also the false expectation that in order to be a musician, we need to be glued to our instrument for six hours a day. And you know what? That's not realistic and that's not healthy. For me, practicing three hours a day is more than enough. Unless let's say I'm preparing for a major competition or a crazy performance. So, well, if I'm playing for three hours, well, <laughs> You can do the math. I have a lot of time to do other things. So there's another skill that you love. There's another area or skill set that you particularly enjoy doing. There is nothing wrong with pursuing that part time. In fact, you might find that it recharges. You might find that it recharges you and refuels you. And so that you're able to step back at the instrument with a fresh perspective. I hope that this video has been insightful and helpful to you. Of course, I welcome your comments down below if you have feedback, would like to share your feelings on the subject, or if you have ideas for future videos. I'll see you on Friday with a Chopin Nocturne and next Tuesday for another vlog. Thanks again.